Hello, this is Antoine Bouet. I'm really sorry I'm not with you today, uh, but I hope that you will enjoy this short video. And Joe and Valeria will have the pleasure to answer questions about an article they didn't write, so I would like to thank them for that. So we did a study entitled Is the Dispute Settlement System Jewel in the WTO's Crown? beyond reach of developing countries. You know what is the dispute settlement system. It is often described as the jewel in the crown of the WTO. And so the question is to know if it is fair for developing countries or if it is beyond reach of developing countries. Since the inception of the World Trade Organization in 1995, Member countries have been heavily relying on the WTO dispute settlement system, what we call the DSS. Um, the, the preceding institution, the GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, generated much frustration and there was a long-term desire for structural reform. With the birth of the WTO, it looks like an actual trade litigation procedure emerged. Uh, according to Renato Ruggiero, the WTO's Director General, it corresponded to the central pillar of the multilateral trading system, which is also an important guarantee of fair trade for less powerful countries. And since 1995, developing countries, including Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, India, Mexico, Pakistan, Peru, Philippines and Thailand, have successfully complained via the DSS about measures implemented by either the European Union or the United States and have obtained withdrawal of a trade measure or an adjustment of a measure to conform with WTO law. So is the DSS accessible to developing countries? What we do here is that we construct a database on trade disputes initiated through the WTO DSS between 1995 and 2014. And we conduct an econometric estimation to determine whether the DSS is rules-based, that is, litigations are open to all countries and settlements are based only on rules, or it is power-based, that is to say, Litigations are not open to all countries, and settlements are based not only on rules, but also on economic power. Why would the DSS be power-based? So we see three reasons. First, reasons. first reason, litigations are costly. So there is a rich literature pointing out the high cost of litigation, in particular implied by the wages of diplomats and lawyers participating in DSS activities, but also the cost of access to the information needed for the litigation. In a case about Japan and photographic film, for example, lawyers claimed remunerations for 10 million US dollars in services. Another example, the U.S. trade representative employs more than 30 lawyers specialized in international trade disputes and adds other lawyers specialized in specific areas for specific disputes. It is likely that these resources are beyond reach of many developing countries and in particular least developed countries. Concerning the cost of these actions, the Advisory Center on WTO Law, what we call the ACWL, was established by a group of developed and developing WTO members that were concerned about the lack of legal capacity of developing countries to access the DSS. And it is now a separate international organization which offers freely or at a low cost legal assistance to poor countries. Second reason, no institutional arrangement so far has addressed the issue of the DSS power to enforce its rulings. So if a respondent does not put its legislation in conformity with the DSS ruling, the complainant may be authorized to implement retaliatory measures. So the question is to know the ability of the complainant to implement retaliatory measures. A lack of retaliatory capacity may prevent a country from complaining. 
A third concern for developing countries may arise from unbalanced bilateral relations. Consider a rich country A being an important destination for country B's exports. Or consider that country A gives either a trade preference to country B or financial or development related aid to country B. B's government may consider that complaining about country A's trade policy may endanger economic activity in B. So, are trade litigations open to all countries? The first test is to look at the list of countries participating in the WTO DSS. So this figure shows the total number of disputes that each member country filed before the DSS from 1995 to 2014. And so a significant number of countries have been absent altogether from formal trade litigation since the WTO's birth including all WTO member African states, but also Bolivia, Cambodia, Guyana, Jordan, and so on. However, this map may simply reflect the predominance of rich countries in international trade. According to our count, in 32% of all cases initiated between 1995 and 2014, either the EU or the United States appeared as either the complainant or the respondent. And during the same period, both countries represented 25% of total world trade. I would like to add two points at this stage. First point, the value of trade may not be the only factor explaining the probability of participating in a trade dispute. A complementary explanation may be the number of traded products and the number of trading partners. Imagine that country A exports the same value of goods to countries B and C, but trade from A to B consists of only one good, whereas trade from A to C consists of N goods with N being relatively large. So there are N potential sources of trade disputes between A and C, whereas there is only one source of trade disputes between A and B. Second point, if a fixed cost is associated with trade litigation, then WTO members may not complain about unfair practices that hurt small export flows. That is, below a certain threshold of trade value, it may not be worth complaining. Consequently, the fact that the poorest countries are mainly involved with small flows may also be an important explanation for their apparent absence from WTO trade disputes. So our study tests whether the WTO DSS is a rules-based system or a power-based system. To do that, we construct a database of trade disputes litigated under the WTO DSS between 1995 and 2014. And we provide detailed statistics on these disputes. We then conduct econometric tests to check if the DSS is accessible to developing countries. So we constructed our database from the WTO website, which provides an updated list of all disputes initiated since 1995. We have observations from 1995 to 2014. Let's have a look at the results. We count 345 initiated trade disputes, of which 218 had been settled by December 31st, 2014. On average, from 1995 to 2014, an average of 17.2 cases have been initiated each year and 10.2 settled, with more dispersions among those initiated. The number of initiated cases may vary with macroeconomic forces, business cycles, the number of WTO members, and other factors. 
whereas the number of settled cases depends mainly on WTO resources. The number of initiated cases per year from 1995 to 2002 is on average higher than from 2003 to 2014. Two reasons may explain this phenomenon. First, many trade disputes not settled under GATT were reinitiated to the dispute settlement body in 1995, 1996 and 1997. Second, after the Banana War, under which Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico and the United States complained about the European regime for the importation, sale and distribution of bananas, many trade disputes involving the United States and the EU occurred in apparent rounds of retaliation. This table indicates the percentage of complaints filed by the United States and the European Union by time period, and we added their share in WTO exports. Both countries together have filed the largest number of complaints in the entire period under study, 32%, confirming that these two trading countries have been the main drivers of the high participations of high-income countries in the DS system. Comparing these shares with the share of each country in WTO members' total exports, it looks like that both countries are significantly overrepresented as DSS complainants. This table indicates the percentage of total complaints filed by the income levels of both complainant and respondent over the period 1995-2014. It shows that almost 80% of trade disputes involved high income and upper and upper middle income countries. The upper middle income country group includes in particular Brazil, China, Mexico, South Africa, and Turkey. More precisely, in 84.4% of all cases, the complainant is either a high-income or an upper-middle-income country, while in 90.7% of all cases, the respondent belongs to one of these two groups. However, over the whole period, these two groups realized 95% of WTO members trade. So in a sense, high income and upper middle income countries may be considered as under participating in the DSS, whereas lower middle income countries may be considered as over participating because with only 4.8% of the share in WTO trade, they participate in 15.7% of all disputes as a complainant and 9.3% as a respondent. So in this study, with this data on trade disputes and also with data collected from other databases, we conducted econometric tests to explain either the probability that there is a conflict between two countries I and J at time T or the number of disputes between two countries I and J at time T. We check the validity of two models. According to the rules-based model, there is no bias in the DSS and the probability that country I initiates a complaint against country J at time period T depends only on the structure and importance of trade between both countries. According to the power-based model, it does not depend only on the structure and importance of trade between both countries. A potential bias may arise, either from the characteristics of one country, independent of the characteristic of the other country, so for example, the legal capacity of the complainant, or from the characteristics of the economic relationship between two countries, I and J, for example, a complainant I with a large retaliatory capacity should have better chances of a respondent J following of a WTO ruling, and thus I would be expected to initiate more disputes against J. What are the results of these econometric tests? 
First, rules-based model works well. The number of products exported by I to J has a positive and significant impact on the probability that country I initiates a complaint against country J. The value of trade between I and J has also a positive and significant impact. And the share of agricultural exports in total exports between I and J has a positive and significant impact also on the same probability. And finally, two countries members of the same reciprocal trade agreement are less likely to initiate a trade dispute. But a few variables related to power also play a role. First, complainant's legal capacity, either measured by percentage of graduates from tertiary education in social science, business and law programs, or by ACWL membership, play a, a positive and significant role in the explanations of the probability of a dispute. And second, complainant's capacity to retaliate, calculated at the share of respondents' total exports sent to complainants, play a positive and significant role in the explanations of the probability of a dispute. So in this study, we constructed a database of trade disputes litigated at the WTO from 1995 to 2014, and we provided a few descriptive statistics about these disputes. Low-income countries are never involved in these disputes, either as complainant or as respondent. Between 80 and 90% of all disputes involve either at least one high-income country or at least one upper-middle-income country. We also test the determinants of both the probability that country I file a complaint against country J and of the number of disputes between the two countries. The DSS appears first as a rules-based dispute settlement system, where the small share of lower middle-income and low-income countries participating in the DSS is mostly explained by their low participations in international trade. Concerning the existence of a potential bias in this dispute settlement system, we obtain two important conclusions. First, legal capacity is an important determinant of the probability and the number of disputes. And it is likely that the advisory center on WTO law, the ACWL, plays an important role in this matter and will continue to play this important role. Second, the trade retaliatory capacity of the complainant also matters. It means that the WTO may face a new challenge, providing a DSS accessible to all countries under the constraint of a growing number of initiated cases.